So glad that um, so many, especially of our transportation related partners are here today. Um, and we're just really glad that hybrid meeting um, for the coalition this year. So I'm um, gonna ask everybody if you can take a seat. We hope you all got a uh, little postcard uh, with you. Because we're doing the hybrid meeting, we're asking um, folks online um, as we get to the end of the presentations or in the middle of our discussions later on to uh, put their questions into the chat so we can um, easily um, translate them over to the rest of the group. And then we're also asking if you're one of the group today, if you have a question um, at the end of Autumn's uh, presentation, then please write that during the presentation, write that on a card. We're going to collect those cards and read them so that everything gets captured well in our recording. Um, so um, make sure you have one of those with you. So uh, thanks, everybody, for being here today. Um, now, we're going to uh, everyone who's online, please be muted. Um, and since it's a small group online, we're hoping that we may be able to do you um, uh, unmuted later on, but um, that would be very helpful to us. Um, and uh, as we uh, get going um, in our process today, I'm Chris Granger, with Nicole Davis, the executive director of Nicole Davis. Um, and I'd like to first introduce um, Lisa Baker. He's a member of the board of directors. He is a former um, executive director of the housing. And uh, she is also on the advisory committee to the uh, transit district and to so begin the interviews on the website. Thank you, Chris. As uh, Chris said, I am on the board of the Davis. I'm also chair of the advisory committee for the transit. And it is my absolute honor and pleasure to introduce your speaker on the main floor. Uh, I'm currently serves as the executive director of the Transit District. And as you know, uh, you may know that the folks who provide transit, that they are also the only local local transportation planning uh, place for Gillen County. Uh, she has over 15 years' experience in urban planning and transportation, and she has uh, a, a plethora of great experience. Um, from her work in the nexus between affordable housing and transportation, transportation of planning and uh, transportation and climate, including uh, climate smart investments. Um, she's worked as a consultant and also in the public sector, and so she's uniquely qualified uh, to serve us here in Yolo. It's been a pleasure to meet with her now for uh, quite a few uh, months. And I think that you, as well as I, will be amazed by what you bring uh, to us today. So with that, I would just like to turn it over to Tom. Uh, wait, wait a second, Bar. Hi there. Thanks. We <laughs> love that introduction. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you. Rest a second. Okay. okay. Get this uh, get okay. slides up. So no worries. Well, anybody got any jokes? <laughs> um, well, I would say uh, I the last time I was in this building uh, was I was I helped organize this, this uh, an annual event for anyone that's called the Blues Bicycle Pilgrimage, um, and it's a it's a weekend event, and it's usually it goes from Spirit Rock in Marin County to a Bayou Buddhist Monastery in San Vicino. But we organized a version of it that came like starting in winters and went to um, Aloka Bahara, which is a Buddhist um, in the uh, senior classic hall. And we stopped here at the um, Bicycle Hall of Fame. So that was a lot of fun. I was in here. Um, and it's a great event to meet with that list. And you think Buddhism is interesting, I'd recommend you check it out. Um, it happens every fall. And I think they're now alternating between the coastal route and the interior. Um, well, I guess I can start by just by way of introduction. Um, uh, yeah, I'm Davis. I have a five year old son named Henry, goes to Davis Waller School. Uh, I first came to Davis um, for my undergrad degree um, in wildlife fish and conservation biology, and um, later came back to do a master's degree at the University in Transportation Technology and Policy. So, this is my third go around in Davis. <laughs> Um, and I hope to be here a lot. 
Maybe can we do a round of introductions in the room, Chris? If we could in here. Yeah. Yeah. That would be great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so you all heard from me. Can you maybe just start reason? Um, I'm Lynn, one of the founders of Cole Davis. It's still active, particularly in the Yellow Energy. It's the kind of that's just said. I'm in action right now. Uh, I'm Ken Kirsch. I'm one of the board directors of Cole Davis, and I own a Macintosh and Bill Davis. Good morning. My name is Tony Amos. I'm one of the Urban Interaction Facilitator and uh, activist for politics and uh, planning. So, therefore, I'm going to be able to do this. How about back here? You can then map. Milton Davis now 30 years. I'm a long time EV driver. And I'm a board member of SAP TV, the largest EV group in the country. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Ray Scott. I'm actually neither of you than David, so I feel like there's the two of us sitting next to each other have had a very different um, levels of experience with David, but uh, I'm also on the board of school David. Uh, my name is Russell Reagan. I made these um, map, bicycling maps. Um, oh. um, David is also one of Woodland, and I had a um, article in the Enterprise two weeks ago about this uh, March bicycling madness um, activity that I'm I'm partaking in. I feel, but I bike 55 miles today. <laughs> Anthony Palmier, I'm a former uh, transportation manager, public transportation and, and bicycle advocate. Hello, I'm Maria Kinter, Kevin, I'm the founder and director for the Bike Campaign. We also operate two bike projects, one here in Davis, at the county, and also in Woodland. Hi, I'm Jason Bond. I'm the president of Board of Davis. So nice to meet you all. Uh, I'm Warren Donovan, I'm the new executive director of Three Davis. Yeah, I'm very good person. I'm president of the Board of Three Davis. And Retired Forest Service Prison Forest Ranger scientist to be able to drive my bike to work throughout my career in Tucson, Chicago, and Davis. So I would like to. I'm Scott Stewart. I am the uh, advocate for Fridays uh, for Future. You see some of their signs around. Uh, and so the vice president of uh, Assessment and ESG work for for Apollo Energies and the founder of the Yellow Climate Emergency Coalition, which put in place the Yellow County Climate Action Commission. Helen Hirsch, a Yellow Mobility, and also the Blue Lines. Here is Sandrowski, the part of Kimi, and I'm a co-chair of Interfaith LT Douglas Davis at Informal Group, Children's Young Children's Young Housing. All right, I'll start. I'm John Johnson. I'm on the City Natural Resources Commission. I'm Christine Heinemeyer. I'm on the board of directors of School Davis. I'm an energy engineer here in town with uh, Frontier Energy. I'm a relatively new heat pump space heater owner and a very new EV owner. <laughs> so we have a couple more people that came in over here. We're just doing introductions. Yeah. Uh, I'm Robin Dabble. I'm on, I'm on the YOLO County Climate Action Commission, and I also am the facilitator for the Climate Crisis Action Team at the Humanitarian University of Davis. Hi, I'm Heidi Lutz, University of Davis, and also affiliated with Cool Davis. So I should see you for a second. <laughs> wow, well, this is an awesome group. I feel like I want to listen to you guys talk. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if having problems getting to um, your PowerPoint to load. Okay. I have my laptop. We like to turn it over I do have my laptop. <laughs> I mean, it's spinning on Google right now. Oh. <laughs> 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 
Can the people online introduce themselves? Oh, that would be great. If you would like to um, each unmute, um, one at a time, I guess. Um, oh, look at that. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And I think we I want to I want to say first of all, um, I I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes. Uh, and then we'll be trying to Q&A. Um, and then I do have to pick up my son around 5 so I'm shooting out of here because I don't want to stick around and talk. But I understand you guys have a lot of other things. Uh, but I, I do have some business cards, and I'm happy to you know share those and follow anybody if we don't get to all your questions or if you just can talk. Um, so with that, we'll launch in. I'm here today to talk about our regional transportation future, and I want to talk both about kind of big picture, like where can and should we go um, with our transit system um, and our multi-modal transportation network? And then also, what are some of the things that they think that we're going to get you about? And maybe, maybe not quite live up to that visionary vision, but are you know steps in the right direction. Um, so a bit kind of aspirational as well as some of the concrete things that we're working on right now to move us in that direction. But there's certainly a lot more that we could and want to be doing. Um, so with that caveat, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. I think the next slide is just a little bit about what I do. Um, yeah, oh, and Lisa kind of covered some of this already, but I'll just say, or if you want to go back on the slide, um, just really quickly. It advanced swirling, then it's just, I think it's a combination of the light. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. <laughs> Yeah, I'm the executive director of the Yolo Transportation District. Um, we are a North Powers Authority made up of Yolo County and five cities um, with, excuse me, the four cities within, within Yolo County, four corporate cities, so Wintersville and Davis and West Sacramento. So we do oversee the daily operations of the Yolo Bus, so many people just think of us as Yolo Bus, but in fact, we are also the multi-modal transportation planning and funding coordination agency for the county. Our annual budget is about 25 million. Most of that does go to transit operations. Um, and we all then collaborate with local, regional, and federal partners on, uh, again, trying to solve collaboratively the, the transportation challenges that we face. Next slide. Yeah. Poor Chris. We're going to get a lot of time. What I'll say is they can see the slides on the other side. Okay, yeah. that's great. Awesome. <laughs> Very cool. Okay, so when we think about um, transportation, uh, I'd like to kind of bring it back to kind of what, how do I think we're kind of an, an intersectional, I think trans transportation needs to be thought of as an engineering issue. I know engineers that it's engineering solution to any transportation problem, but I think we're trying to take a more holistic view of transportation these days. Um, and so this kind of triple bottom line concept, you know, applied in the context, in the context of transportation, right? We think about the fact that transportation investment is really critical for our economy, whether it's moving people or moving goods. Um, you know, that's a, it's a really important for, um, for just kind of allowing for the wealth generation that is an important part of, of our society. Uh, it's also really important when we think about um, upward mobility. So, in fact, there's been recent studies that have shown that transportation is the single greatest factor in escaping poverty, more significant than crime, test scores, or single parent households. And this has to do with the fact that you have access to opportunity, you have access to education, and other jobs. Uh, it can provide a really important bridge, you know, or a way of getting um, uh, to better, more access to resources, more access to opportunity. And then, of course, environmental sustainability. Um, and so, this is where we're going to focus a lot today. Um, as you all know, transportation is the largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions here in California. A little, we're a little bit different from the rest of the country in that way, partly because we've done so much to clean our energy sector. Uh, and it's more, it's larger than the next eight, can't quite see, sectors. <laughs> <laughs> It's quite uh, it's quite big. Uh, next, okay, next two. Sorry, not <laughs> next day. Next two sectors. Uh, next slide. 
Okay, um, so our vision values and priorities at the district, um, uh, we provide single sustainable mobility solutions, but I want to focus on the core values. Um, these were just recently updated by our board last, uh, late last year. We're about, we're, we're transparent and accountable to the public. Um, we're committed to addressing inequities and improving outcomes for our most vulnerable communities. Um, we prioritize environmental sustainability and climate resilience and responsible stewardship of public funds. Next slide. So when we talk about reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions and transportation, um, there's a, a, a one thing we like to think of it as kind of a three-legged stool, right? Um, the first being improving the fuel economy of our vehicles, the second being reducing the carbon content of our fuels. So we have a couple of electric car rooms here, we've talked about that. And of course, improving the fuel economy, California is a real leader in this. Um, and we've made a lot of progress in terms of looking at our scoping plan, you know, under 8032 in terms of these two areas, right? And we have very ambitious goals in both of those areas. We also have very ambitious goals in the third leg of the school, which is reducing vehicle miles traveled or BMT. This is essentially, can we drive once? And this is the place where actually we are not making progress, we're going the other direction, right? And so this is, I would say the leg of the school that is wobbling and has been wobbling. And I think the state is increasingly working to get its arms around this, um, but you know, it's the area that I think we as an agency have the most to offer um, and we have also left the biggest uphill challenges, if you will, for this sector. Next slide. Um, so I want to start by uh, talking about Stockholm, Lisbon. I think this might be Amsterdam. I'm not sure what this is. Go any, in any European city, right? One thing I often hear is like, you go to Europe and like, you don't even think about needing a car. Right? You can just get around, whether it's streetcar, subway, bike, walk. You know, is this possible? Is it possible for us to have this kind of, of system here in the United States? And, and what would it take uh, for us to really have transit on this scale? And so um, uh, the next bit of animation, if you just click the next button, there should be some things that pop up, hopefully this will work. So there's three kind of factors that I want to just kind of highlight. Um, just one more, one more click. The first is urban form. Um, so we live, for better or worse, in an area that has kind of developed in the mid to late 20th century, right? Fairly low dense compared to places in Europe and other parts of the US um, where cities were originally designed for people to walk um, or for maybe to get around, you know, using kind of slower modes of transportation. So we don't have the density currently um, that would really support very high quality transit, um, at least not here in some parts of our region. Too. And that's really starting to change as we're seeing the increasing densification. But it's really, I just want to highlight how critical it is. You cannot have effective transit if people can't walk to it easily. It's not within walking distance of a lot of destinations. And if you've ever been in the light rail in Sacramento, um, you know you know what I'm talking about in terms of the fact you don't see a lot of people on the light rail. And the light rail itself, the stations in many places are not accessible to get to the destinations, especially if you get, if you get out towards Folsom. You know where the where the the stations are kind of in the middle of the freeway, and then there's like an industrial area and a golf course. And like in order to get to anything, you have to walk at least a mile. So urban form is a really critical piece of this. We're not going to talk a lot about about it today, but I know a number of you talk about housing, and I just think that that's a really important nexus. Um, next step, uh, next one is um, making cars less convenient, right? So if you've been to Europe, if you've ever tried to drive around a European city, you know it's impossible. Um, and so part of making transit a better, more attractive option right, it is to make driving less convenient. This has to do with like, you know, where you have parking everywhere, you're picking up your urban space for parking cars rather than for destinations for people. Um, and these these are, like, it's a kind of a zero sum game. The more your urban space and street space is dedicated to cars, the less walkable, the less transit oriented. So making cars less convenient is an important part of the equation. Next slide. I'm oh, sorry. Next click. Yeah. So and then third and finally is investment in transit. And how much are we as as a society willing to actually spend on transit? And we'll come back to that at the end. But I wanted to just kind of highlight these two. Like when we talk, we can't just talk about transit without talking about these other pieces because they're really important. Next slide. So um, what are the elements? Of, so now focusing on transit. You know, what are some of the elements that make that um, really effective? So I'm going to talk quickly about rail. Quickly, but I'm going to talk about rail transit. I'm going to talk about the next generation of bus transit. I'm going to talk about on-demand transit, also human-powered transportation, which is also a key piece. And then, you know, how do we reduce the incentives to drive? Some ideas and some things to work. 
So on rail transit, um, uh, as you all know, the, the rail transit that we have here, of course, is the capital corridor, um, which I would argue is becoming more important than ever, as we've seen in the kind of demographic people kind of spilling out of the Bay Area and into Northern California and into the Sacramento region, and people that are now commuting a couple days a week to the Bay Area, well, but they're living in Roseville, they're living in Elk Grove, they're living in Davis, right? The pandemic and the kind of whole change we've seen with working from home. You know, we really do have more of these long distance commuters that's not commuting every day. Um, so a couple of things that Capital Corridor is doing right now, you know, there's of course a bunch of improvements planned at the Davis train station um, to kind of just make it work better. Um, and also to help address some of the connectivity with like all of drive and making it more accessible for people to kind of um, access the train station from the other side. Um, as well, there's a third track project um, that would basically have to add a third track between downtown Sacramento and Roseville. Right now, there's one train a day between Roseville and Sacramento, and therefore Roseville and the Bay Area. Um, uh, but this, this third project would allow um, for there to be 10 trains a day um, between Roseville and Sacramento, which again, just improves the connectivity for the entire corridor, makes capital more viable. And then also, um, they're really looking at innovating with ways to make um, to make Apple Portal more affordable. We know that it's been primarily you know, white collar commuters because it's expensive, um, but we know that a lot of white collar commuters are not commuting anymore. They're working from home or they're commuting a couple of days a week. And so, how can we make? But there's a lot of people who are priced out of the Bay Area but are commuting that direction. So, how do we make it a more affordable option for them? And I'd say that's a theme generally across transit, but particularly for these high cost kind of services like Capital Corridor, which have really been the domain of people who are just not running transit daily anymore. Uh, next slide. Um, so next I wanna talk about the next generation of bus transit. Um, and so when we think about buses, um, you know, how do we really envision buses Buses are the workforce of our not really high density enough to really support kind of subways or kind of rail transit streetcars, etc. But when we think about buses, how do we make them work better? So this is the AP Transit Tempo. This is the first bus rapid transit project in the East Bay, and the first in, in Northern California um, that goes basically from East Oakland all the way to downtown Northland. Um, and what it is, is it's a bus that's running on dedicated lanes um, and it has transit signal priority. So when the, 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 when the light sees it, the light turns green, it's got stations in the middle of the street um, so that the bus is not having to pull over out of traffic and then get back into traffic. Um, and it runs every 10 minutes between 6 a.m. and 11 p.m. So it's really like you're kind of getting a, a quality of like a train type experience at a fraction of the price. And because you're, you know, the infrastructure is there in terms of you're building the dedicated lanes, but it costs way less to do this than to put in a subway or like it. And so this is the solution that I think we really need to be looking at. Um, here in the Sacramento region, because it's 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 frankly more practical than rail, but it gives you a lot of the benefits of having, you know, you don't have to plan, you don't have to know when the bus is coming, you can just show up and know that there's going to be a bus there soon enough, right? That's what, when you have a high quality transit system, you, you know, you don't actually have to like read the schedule because you just know if you show up, there's going to be something that's going to get you there, right? And we can't afford it, don't have the density to do it with, with rail, but bus rapid transit is a, is a way that we can. Um, next slide. So, um, oops, go back one. So we're not there yet, but I am very proud of the fact that for the first time in its history, we now have a new bus service that is more than once an hour, <laughs> and that's the route, our route 42, which is our inner city loop, um, which goes from Davis, it goes, it's to the clockwise and counterclockwise loop between connecting all the major cities of Yellow County and downtown Sacramento and the airport. It's now every 30 minutes during peak hours in the morning and the afternoon. And we've also streamlined the route so that the overall travel time is faster. Um, and we've seen that, so those changes took effect, um, or one, one pulse of changes took effect in September and then another pulse in January. And we've seen just since uh, September, we've seen a 30% increase in ridership on the 42. So people, that's about 30,000 people additional rides. So um, it's been a really positive re reaction response to that. So just going from once an hour to every 30 minutes. And every 30 minutes is not even a gold standard. You know, we need to be going to 15, 20 minute headways if we can during the peak hours. So, um, and we don't have yet dedicated lanes. So our buses do still sit in traffic in congested areas like along Russell, for example. So, you know, we're starting to put the pieces in place to really have that kind of high quality backbone service, but there's a lot more that we need to do. Next slide. 
Um, and then another piece, I think, of kind of where transit needs to head is around like, the, the, the carbon emissions associated with the buses themselves. And so the Air Resources Board um, did establish um, an innovative clean transportation program, uh, which requires all transit agencies to transition them to clean, cleaner fuels. We currently, most of our services run on compressed natural gas, but it really will require, require us going to battery electric um, or hydrogen fuel cell. So we're in the process of planning that transition right now, but we do with our causeway connection, uh, that is a uh, fully electric uh, Proterra uh, buses that, that, that do that, and that connects UC Davis to the UC Davis Med Center in Sacramento. So that um, clean technology, we're already you know, using it, um, but we're gonna be going to 100% of clean fleet. And the other reason I wanted to mention the causeway connections, because this is actually a partnership between UC Davis, our agency, and also SACRT, um, one of the things that I think when we think about a regional transit system, given the fact that we are so spread out now, people live further, further from their jobs, we are a single county transit agency, which, you know, is very limiting when you think about how expensive, you know, it is becoming Yolo County. There are so many people that now can afford to live in Yolo County and are commuting in, right, as the university. Um, and so how, we have to partner with agencies like SACRT, with, with, with Solano County, Soul Trans, in order to make it so that people can really get across county lines, we, you know. So I think here in Northern California, our transit system is very siloed into these little buckets. Uh, and oftentimes we're agencies competing with each other over money. It's like it's crazy. So you know, the increasing coordination projects like the Causeway Connection to cross those jurisdictional lines to make us seem much good, I think is really important. All right, next slide. Um, so the next thing I'll talk about is on-demand service. So this is um, this is the idea of kind of can transit be a bit more like Uber or Lyft. And some of you may have seen this if you've ridden the Smart Ride in Sacramento or the on West Sacramento on-demand. We currently have kind of a beta version of this um, but that currently serves Knights Landing in winter. So we don't have fixed route bus service there. But if you live in Knights Landing or winters, you can call a phone number and schedule a trip between eight to five, Monday through Friday, and some weekend service. And then the bus will come pick you up at your door and take you where you need to go. Um, for nights landing, it's in Woodland, and for winters, it's for Davis or Vacaville. Um, so this is a pretty cool, people really love this service. Um, uh, and we're, but we're kind of gonna be revamping it and expanding it. So if you go to the next side, the next slide, excuse me, um, uh, you're kind of, we're going to be rebranding it as um, the Beeline by Yolo Bus, uh, getting you from point A to B, because that's what it is, it's a point-to-point -point service. And we're going to be launching it in Woodlands, the entire city of Woodland is going to be covered by this service. So if you're anywhere in Woodland, you'll be able to, you know, you, and we're also launching this ride code app, which kind of looks like yeah, the Uber app, where you say, here's where I am, and here's where I'm trying to go. And then it'll tell you, oh, sure. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so this will allow you to basically book an app in real time and it'll tell you your vehicle will be here in 15 minutes or 20 minutes or five minutes, depending on how far it is away. And it's um, it's an algorithm kind of like the, that will basically connect your trip with other trips. So other, you know, it, it'll essentially tell the driver where to go to pick you up and then drop this person on pick this person up um, so that you're sharing rides. But again, it's, it gives you more flexibility than uh, traditional fixed route transit. So we're really excited about this. Uh, next slide. So then, of course, human powered transportation continues to be really important, um, whether that's just good old fashioned biking and walking, um, but as well, you know, some of the innovations in this space that we've seen. I'm excited for that scooter share and bike share is coming back to Davis. Um, so that's a great thing that's going to be happening. I think, well, you know, when we did have the, um, the, the bike share here before, we had the highest utilization anywhere in the U.S., second only in Paris, here in Davis. Um, and that's, you know, that really says something for a little town of Davis, you know, I mean, we're exceptional in lots of ways. Um, but, you know, there is a real place for, for these modes. Um, and and then I also put in the, the, the picture of the electric bike here, both because I think e-bikes really have the potential to revolutionize things. I actually lived in Winters for a while when I was in grad school at UC Davis, and I had an e-bike, and I would bike back and forth using an e-bike. I was, I was not going to do that every day with a regular bike, but with an e-bike, it totally made it doable and pleasurable. Um, and there's a lot of programs now that are looking to incentivize and lower the cost of e-bikes. Here at, at, at my agency, we, we, uh, we run the YOLO Commute program, um, and we have a, they have a new program, Yolo Commute does, where we have a fleet of e-bikes 
that um, our members, uh, which are basically local businesses, um, can borrow those bikes and then loan them out to their employees so they can try out trying out an e-bike and see you know see if you like it. And there's increasingly there's other incentives coming online. We also for me as bike month this year uh, for Yolo Commute, we're offering hundred dollars uh, for bike parts, two hundred dollars to buy an e-bicycle, or three hundred dollars towards the purchase of an e bike. Um, so we're trying to really get them to encourage people to explore these. And, and I think there's more and more of those initiatives coming online in the state level as well. Um, next slide. And then lastly, I want to just talk a little bit about reducing the incentives to drive. Uh, because when you take a step back and think about it, we ask people, and often they are the, some of the poorest people in our community, to cough up 250 or 325 to get on the bus. But you can get on the freeway anytime you want for free. Um, we have, and if, if what we want to do is encourage people to take transit and discourage people from driving, we frankly, we need to change the incentives. And some of this is also about parking, right? We actually, the literature tells us that one of the biggest determinants of whether people drive or take transit is whether or not there is free parking where they're going. Um, so nobody likes to pay for parking, <laughs> but, you know, from a sleep perspective and from the getting people out of their car perspective, even if it's 50 cents, it's a psychological barrier, um, and it's, an, it's amazing the transformative power of, of, of parking pricing. So that's my little plug for parking pricing. We're not doing anything on it, um, but uh, but it's it actually is a very powerful tool. Um, and then uh, pricing the roads. Um, this is going to be my segue into talking about what we're doing with Interstate 80, and some of you have probably heard about this already. Uh, I know Mr. Hirsch certainly has, and it's painful to end with. <laughs> um, so, but uh, we are working to bring congestion pricing to the Sacramento region um, here in Yolo County, and I want to tell you a little bit more about that. So, thanks, Um Okay, yeah. So, this is just kind of a lead up. You can skip through this slide. Uh, we're going to talk about the Yolo 80 corridor improvements project. Um, so, uh, a little bit of background. We know that the Interstate 80 is a bottleneck uh, for cars, transit, and freight. Um, the, there's actually currently widening, widening is happening both on the Salon County side and the Sacramento County side, right? And you, as you probably noticed, when you're driving in, the freeway gets goes down to three lanes through Dolo County, um, but it's four lanes on the Salon side, and they're adding another lane right now. And it's um, it's a uh, I think they're adding a six lane to fifty um, in Sacramento, just on the other side of the river. Um, this is a good and a bad thing. You know, it's a good thing from the perspective of some people just don't want to, they know it's going to be terrible coming through Yellow County, so maybe they don't drive, maybe they'll take the Capitol Corridor instead, right? Uh, but uh, but we also know that it has local air pollution impacts. It creates crazy cut-through traffic issues in our neighborhoods. Um, so there's real downsides to being the bottleneck in all of Northern California for the only east-west crossing of the Yellow Bypass, right? Um, this is one of 12 priority projects that the Northern California mega region has identified. That's SACOG, our regional transportation agency, MTC, the Bay Area's regional transportation agency, and also San Joaquin County. So one of 12 projects, only four of those are highway projects, but that's the rail projects. Um, but this is one of them. Um, uh, it's also really important to improving transit reliability and bicycle safety because the our bus has been in that traffic too. Um, so if you're taking the bus and you're sitting in traffic, this goes back to like, you know, how do we make high quality transit? If buses are sitting in traffic too, it's a problem. Um, why would you think it? Uh, and then bicycle safety, this project does include some improvements to improve safety for people who are biking across the causeway. And then lastly, congestion pricing is a key strategy to meeting our regional greenhouse gas targets. So SAFOG, our regional transportation agency, has a greenhouse gas target that they have to meet under state law. They can't meet it unless we have congestion pricing in the Sacramento region. Um, so those are all some of the reasons that we think we're, that we're, we're planning this project. Next slide. Uh, so the project area, we're really talking about Interstate 80 all, all the way across Yolo County and then the small segment of 50. Um, it's a partnership between Caltrans and Yolo TV. It would add one new traffic lane each way from Sacramento County to Solano County and no widening of the existing causeway structure, importantly. So this is really taking the shoulder, the inside shoulder, and converting it to a lane. And the key question is what kind of lane will it be? Next slide. 
So our, uh, our board adopted a set of goals for the project back in December of 2021 around supporting state climate goals and, and minimizing vehicle mass travel, increasing transit ridership through motor share, bike safety, equity, et cetera. Um, next slide. So we started looking at this question of, you know, if we're going to widen the freeway, what is what are the climate impacts going to be and what are the equity impacts going to be? And one of the first things we looked at is the research from UC Davis and others um, that if you increase highway capacity, you're unlikely to relieve traffic congestion due to the phenomenon of induced travel. So when you widen the freeway and create more capacity, people are like, oh, come on, it's not crowded on the causeway anymore. I can drive more. Fantastic. Um, so that happens immediately. Uh, and then also over the long term, when these patterns change, right? People decide, well, maybe I will build that extra thing in the Thomas because now I can, people can get there, right? Or the university, like, well, maybe I can, we can build more now because now all of our folks who live in Sacramento can get there. So that's the kind of long-term induced demand as well as the short-term behavior change. And the, the research is, just, sorry, the research is known that it's about a one-to-one -one relationship over 10 years. So for every, every basically every one mile we add, like, 10 years later, you've just added that many cars to so that lane. Um, so you really, you, you, you buy yourself about 10 years of, of really used traffic congestion if you just widen the highway in the conventional way. Next slide. So then car, um, when we entered this, when we, when we entered started engaging with CalFans, their preference was to build carpool lane. Um, but what a carpool lane work? Well, 40% of California's carpool lanes are congested during the afternoon commute. 39% of those are severely congested. <laughs> Um, and Caltrans preliminary analysis would find found that a carpool on, on this stretch of 80 would be congested the day it opens because the congestion is just that bad already. And we also know that from a climate and induced demand perspective, when it's not operating as a carpool lane, it serves as a general purpose lane. So, you know, it's basically functioning like just again, inducing demand for all those hours when it's not a carpool lane. Uh, next slide. So um, a brief interlude while we're talking about climate, I just want to talk about the fact that there's also a very important equity consideration when we think about freeways. The freeways here in our region, as well as everywhere in California, and frankly, in our country, were disproportionately built in low-income black and proud neighborhoods. So the 80-50 interchange, it's in West Sacramento. That is not a coincidence, um, because those there was a revolt against the freeway, road, the freeway building in neighborhoods why the wealthier neighborhoods were successfully were able to kill highway projects in their neighborhoods and get them rerouted in their low-income neighborhoods who have less political power. Um, and that has had property value impacts, air quality impacts, health impacts for decades. Um, and so when we look at, at kind of the having this road that is free, but you have all these negative externalities for communities along the freeway, you know, that creates a disproportionate uh, impact on communities. So there was actually a proposal to ban freeway extensions in underserved communities. It did, did not pass, but it's uh, it's something that is still out there. And the Prince University of Southern California is committed to reintroducing it every year. <laughs> Next slide. Um, so that got us looking at an express lane. Uh, an express lane is a freeway lane that's free for some users, priced for others. Usually it is free for carpools, transit vehicles, and in some cases, clean air vehicles or electric vehicles. Um, well, it, and you have to pay a price if you are a single occupant vehicle and you want to pay to use the ex extra capacity that's in the lane. Toll prices are dynamically managed. So the, the worse the traffic is, the more people want that lane, the higher the price goes. And so what that does is it allows you to actively manage the lane. So it actually performs better for congestion because if there's demand, if the freeway that starts to flow down, when you increase the price, and that will push some people out of the lane, they'll choose to get out of the lane. So these actually perform better from a congestion perspective because you have an option to, to buy in and, uh, and, and they, they work pretty well. Um, and it creates a revenue stream that you can use to invest in your goals. And those goals might be increasing transit, it might be addressing transportation equity, whatever your goals are, you're creating a source of revenue that you can use to invest in meeting those goals. Next slide. You've probably seen these lanes, right? If you're, if you're driven in the Bay Area, you've probably seen them. So a case study we looked at was LA Metro's Express Lane program. LA Metro's Express Lane came online in like 2012, 2013, thereabouts. Um, next slide. Um, and what they did is they created a net toll reinvestment program where about 40% of the funds from those the, the, the revenues are invested in transit. 
about 40% are in system connectivity and active transportation. This is really focused on like the low income neighborhoods adjacent to the freeway. So it's like bicycle infrastructure, uh, it's station improvements, it's kind of complete street projects, that kind of a thing. And then about 20% goes to kind of reinvest in the roadway maintenance, um, maintenance for the system. Um, here's an animation on this one as well. Um, yeah, so since 2015, LA Metro has provided 55.6 million in total revenues to improve transit. That's a significant amount of um, to improve transit service. Next slide. So, um, our my agency, Yolo TV, we wrote a letter to Caltrans last June and said the new lanes should be toll lanes, not carpool lanes. The revenue from toll lanes should be reinvested in transit and transportation equity programs in disadvantaged communities adjacent to the freeway. Um, and it should include additional investments to prioritize transit. So uh, there's a few things here, and I can go in more depth if anybody wants to. Uh, uh, but some technology stuff around speeding up transit. Next slide. Um, so the total project costs about $387 million. Uh, the phase one project cost, phase one is from Richards Boulevard here in Davis to the 80-50 split in West Sacramento, and it's about $232 million. Um, we have about uh, 92, 93 million dollars in secured funding, and we have applied for uh, 103 million from a state program and then another 13 million from state. Fund. If we get those, which we'll know in the next four or five months, we would have enough funding to move forward with phase one. Next slide. So, where this project is, is it's a little outdated now. We just found out that the draft our EIS has been delayed. It was supposed to come out in April, it's going to be coming out in June. Um, which is also when we're going to find out if we've got that $130 million from the state. Um, the final EIR EIS is going to be certified by the end of the year. And then um, construction would begin in summer 2025 with the lane opening in 2027, if all goes well. Uh, next slide. So now I just wanted to um, think of the barriers you can see with the top. I wanted to come back to this issue of transit funding because we talked about up front, like what would it take to be Stockholm, right? Transit investment is really key. Um, and so what this says is this is a map of transit spending per capita in the United States. So we are in much better shape than many of the states in the middle of the country. We spend about $100 to $200 per year here in California per capita on transit, not as much as New York and D.C., um, which are in a higher tier, um, and interestingly, Massachusetts. Go to Massachusetts and maybe a little bit of Rhode Island too. Um, so, uh, so anyway, but um, but what I want to talk about next is the fact that that transit spending here in California is not spread around like peanut butter. So next slide. Um, so transit is funded in California. But there's two major sources, two major sources that every county has, and there's a third that some do and some don't. The first is the Federal Transit Administration provides funding by formula. Um, so every kind of urbanized area in the country is eligible for that funding by formula, kind of based on population and a few other things. There is also some grant money available in FTA. But importantly, it requires a local match. So in order to only access as many funds as you have a local match for. Um, and those funds can be used for transit operations as well as like buying buses, putting in bus stops, they all capital needs, et cetera. Um, here in California, we have what's called our state transit assistance and local transportation funds that are funded through various like sales tax and diesel excise taxes and stuff that provide that local match. Um, the county gets about $17.5 million per year in those funds. That's how much we got last year. But importantly, there is a loophole that allows small counties like ours to use that funding for stuff other than transit if there's no one that transit needs. And so here in Yellow County, actually less than half of that money actually goes to transit, and the rest actually goes to local streets and roads projects. Um, and so what that means is not only we're we not getting that money, we're also leaving all the federal the federal money on the table because we don't have that local match. So you know about eight million dollars a year of that state money, again, is being spent on local streets and roads, and then. You know, then again, you can double that in terms of the uh, depending on whether you're using it for operations or capital. For capital projects, you only need a 20% match. So we are leaving literally tens of millions of dollars on the table in federal funds for transit here in Yellow County because we don't use it for transit. Um, so something to note, <laughs> that's something that could change. 
Um, and then some counties tax themselves to pay for transit and other transportation improvements, but Yolo County does not. So we call these self-help counties um, that, that pass basically transportation sales tax measures um, to, to fund transit. It can also be used to fund other things as well. So there's a lot of opportunity to improve transit um, if we choose to prioritize funds that we have for transit and also to you know create new sources of revenue. Now, of course, the tollings will also create the new source of revenue um, for transit, and that's something that um, is exciting, and that will be an ongoing source of funding. Um, but there's a lot of other money that we're leaving on the table. Um, so with that, uh, I think that is my, there's one more slide that's, I think, yeah, just to wrap up. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed this kind of stream of consciousness and romp through, <laughs> through um, kind of transit and associated thoughts. Um, but then with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, so I'm going to ask the folks um, who are um, online to put their questions if they have any in the chat um, at this point. Um, and then um, if any of you have cards uh, with questions on them, you um, can pass them forward. I would, that would be great. And now we should start it with the questions. Okay. I'm not sure I'm seeing. Sorry about the sound on the folks online. I think I talk really fast too. That probably didn't help. Okay. So I don't don't see any yet um, in the chat. Um, so we'll start with. Um, so I'm not here. Put your hand in the air when you hear your question. So just uh, bottom tap in terms of who it was. In case you didn't put your name on it. So seeing how electrification of transportation is critical, how do we deliver private transportation accurately? Private transportation in terms of, maybe I just have to clarify my question in terms of like individual transportation, like cars and bikes and that sort of thing? Or cars and bikes, yeah. Um, well, it's a good question. You know, I, I do think that there's a, the state has been, I know has had for, for some time, a, a program to provide kind of tax credits for low-income people to buy electric vehicles to help offset the uh, cost because, you know, electric vehicles tend to cost more, right, than, than fossil fuel vehicles. As well, um, I believe there is now an e-buying incentive uh, to the tax credit. I'm not sure that there's an income to that. Um, but you know, that, uh, I think making e-bikes more affordable is actually a really great solution, um, for, uh, for low-income people, uh, particularly here in Yolo County. Uh, you know, we have a lot of folks that commute between like Woodland or Dixon, for example, and Davis, um, and, uh, and having, you know, having safer bicycle facilities is an important piece of it as well, but if I can let, you know, and then something I forgot to mention is that we are actually also working on a project. We got a federal grant to plan entry city bike trails connecting the cities in Yolo County. Um, so yeah, that's something that I, I meant to mention when we were on that slide and I forgot it. But, so that planning effort is going to be kicking off just as soon as Caltrans signs our agreement. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, but in terms of, uh, you know, I, I, I think that the, uh, the other big challenge that we're going to have with kind of electrification is the, the kind of the infrastructure for the charging infrastructure, right? Uh, and particularly for low-income folks who don't necessarily own a home. Um, so where are they able to charge? I mean, charging infrastructure is a public infrastructure is a big problem, right? You know, uh, as we all know, there's not enough chargers and they have lots of issues unless you're in the states of Tesla. <laughs> um, so, but like for people who live in apartments, for example, um, can we make it so that people who live in apartments have access um, to, to charge their vehicles? So I, it, as well as just kind of having sufficient public charging. There's also, um, in some places, um, electric car sharing programs that are specifically targeting low-income areas. There's one in, um, in Los Angeles um, that I think is, a, is an interesting model. And, and then there's also one focused on rural communities in the San Joaquin Valley called Neocar, um, which is trying to bring car sharing to communities that are too rural to have transit service that really works and where folks would support anything on their own cars. 
So those are like a couple of like programs that I've been keeping an eye on that I think are pretty interesting and that uh, you know it would be cool to experiment with here in Willow County. So um, another question: um, What are the future modal mode share goals for public transportation? No, if we have adopted mode share goals for the region, we might. But if we do, that would be a safe out question. I don't know what they are. I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer. If you follow up with me, I can look that up. So here's some uh, questions about um, lanes. Um, how will adding lane reduce travel and GHG when studies show adding lanes increases travel? Yeah, so adding a lane will not reduce travel. Um, adding a lane that is a toll lane will uh, induce less travel and will also offset some of the induced travel by generating a source of revenue that can use to increase transit service. So um, widening the highway will always lead to inducing travel. So the question is, how do we widen the highway? If we choose, if we choose to widen the highway, um, and that is a choice, um, how do we do it in the way that's most environmentally responsible and socially responsible? So I mean I will say that the the, the, the questioner is absolutely right <laughs> that uh, you can't widen the highway and not travel. So there's a follow up on that one. Just to clarify, what Adam presented, um, your your uh, was the suggested the express lane, but did you is, is there a follow up to that? Is that what is going to happen? That is what is going to happen. Yes. I think it was the slide missing. We actually did sign an MOU with Caltrans last fall saying that the per I mean it still has to go through environmental review, but yes, the project description is now an express lane. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Um so there's another question about express lanes. Um uh, do express lanes have an equity impact? Um does this mean that wealthier drivers get to go faster? <laughs> so this is a great question. I'm glad I came up. Um uh so the the research around this is two different two different points, and I touched on one of these, which is that freeways are not actually free. We do pay for them. We just don't pay for them. We pay for them through gas taxes, and we pay for them through sales taxes in ways in, in places that are, that actually have sales taxes, both of which are progressive forms of taxation. Um, and we could get into why that is. So gen generally, congestion pricing is considered to be more equitable than the way we currently pay for our freeways because it pay as you go, right? You're actually paying as you use the freeway. Um, but importantly, in order for the for it to be equitable, you need to be reinvesting your revenue that you're generating in a way that it, that benefits low-income people. Not all low-income people ride transit. Some low-income people do have cars because they can't get where they need to go on transit. So just investing in transit is necessary but not sufficient. Um, so one thing that uh, other places um, have done is they have they offer low income discounts for tolls. So the Bay Area is actually designing a pilot program on this right now, where if you're eligible for, you know, whether it's now other types of benefits, then you're automatically eligible for discounted tolls. Mm -hmm. So that is a way of kind of trying to make the toll lanes more affordable to low income people. Um, but also the research where toll lanes have been implemented does show that, well, uh, people with more money tend to use them more often. Um, everybody uses them, including low-income people, but they do use them less frequently. So it is an option that people do use. Um, and again, it just has to do with how, how often are they making that choice uh, to use them. So this is a question around dollars. Um, who makes the decisions on how the STA and LTF funds are used in Europe? Great question. Um, so that decision is made, uh, it's complicated, but the, the Yolo, my board, the Yolo TD board approves our budget for the year, and that includes how much service we're planning to provide. Um, and then any money that we don't need, then the SACOM board of directors, our regional agency, then has the authority to redistribute it to other, to the jurisdictions in the county. Um, so Davis, Woodland, Winters, and one second. There's a question around trains. Um, has Amtrak ridership fallen? And if so, what does the financial future of Amtrak look like? Yeah, every transit agency has taken a big hit with COVID. The trains have been harder hit than buses, kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier, because um, a lot of folks who ride buses don't have a choice, right? They, they are transit dependent. And so, um, we, our ridership is in the corridor of our uh, 
Um, uh, and uh, I'm drawing a blank. Caltrain, <laughs> excuse me. So yes, the ridership absolutely has declined, and frankly, those bigger agencies are really facing an existential crisis right now because it is expensive to run train service, and ridership has not rebounded. Um, and without addition, they've been relying on kind of recovery funds like um, the, you know, the ARPA, the American Recovery Plan Act, and whatnot. Um, and without additional funding, they're going to have to really dramatically reduce service. Um, so there's a big push right now the California Transit Association and also nationally uh, to, to try to kind of bail out transit. That's a topic of terrible. Why did I say bail out? That's not really good. <laughs> I'm thinking about Silicon Valley Bank. <laughs> Anyway, I was listening to that on the way over here, listening to PR talking about bailouts. Anyway, they're looking for, um, you know, additional funding to kind of keep those services going so they don't have to dramatically cut service. Let's see. Um, is there any plans for transit connections to this case? Right now, there's no plans, uh, but we are actually... Uh, with along in partnership with the university, um, we recently put, put, put a, together a scope of work uh, to update the campus uh, transportation master plan with a focus on looking at people getting to campus who don't live in, in, in Davis. Because you know, traditionally, most of the students and faculty and staff who live in Davis, that's no longer the case as Davis has become more expensive. Um, so Part of that is looking at Solano County, the rest of Yolo County, um, and Sacramento County. So hopefully we'll be getting that underway later this year, or early next year, but we have no immediate plans to expand service to Dixon, unfortunately, but we love to. So some bike questions. Um, what is Bike TD doing to support safe storage for e-bikes, particularly low, for low-income households? A great question. I mean, we're not doing anything right now, but I do think that that is a real need um uh the bike link locker system there's a couple of them here at the train station they're much more ubiquitous in some parts of the east bay in the area uh, i think it's a really good system um and it's very affordable for the user um and it works fairly well so uh, i think it's a technology that we need to be thinking much more about uh, having more secure bike parking um, but we're not doing anything with it at the moment um, and then um, a second one around on bike share. Uh, you mentioned a new the return of the bike share program to Davis. Are there any lessons learned for um, from the past for the future program? Well, interestingly, you know, and, and I think folks are aware of this. The new bike, the new bike share is coming with scooters. Um, and you know, from the, what we've seen is that the industry, uh, the private providers of these bike share systems, they don't want to do it without scooters. Um, because the scooters are really where they make their money. Um, and I think that's interesting. For those of us who grew up biking like I did, you know, like scooters, I think they're terrifying, but people love them. Uh, people younger than me <laughs> love them and don't find them terrifying like they do. Um, and so, you know, and for me, I think it's been a process of acceptance that scooters are part of the reality um, and that they really work really well for a lot of people, And but they need to be well regulated. So, um, you know, the, the scooters can be a nightmare if they're just kind of left everywhere and on sidewalks um, and they're, they're a hazard. Um, in order to really, for them to work and for them to be safe, you have to have good um, bicycle infrastructure, you have to have, especially in kind of the urban core and places where people live, where they do tend to end up on the sidewalks because people don't feel safe biking on the riding them on the street. So the city will share shared scooters and bikes um, to their downtown, but their downtown does not have, yeah, in my opinion, a sufficient bicycle network in order to make that safe and effective. So what I actually counseled them that they should hold off. Um, until they've done some of the planned investments in their bicycle network so that they can avoid a situation where they have them running in the sidewalks. Those are some of my thoughts. Um, uh, so uh, a couple of last questions here. Um, what if the 240 million were spent more directly on greenhouse gas mitigation? What would that look like? Like buying more buses, aging, other kinds of infrastructure? What, you know, well, I'm sure the Capital Corridor would love to put that towards their third track to Roseville project. <laughs> um, I, I know that they're so fundraising for that, and that's, a, that's an expensive one. So, I mean, that kind of money could go a long way towards investments in capital, for sure, um, buying buses um, and making track improvements. The other thing that the Capital 
border is reckoning with is a lot of their tracks in the East Bay, if you've kind of ridden it between Richmond and Martinez, you know it's right at sea level, it's right on the bay. And when sea level rise, it's going to be very, and it's also true of kind of between San Jose and Fremont as well. Um, it's going to be very expensive to lift those tracks up. It's the same problem that State Route 37 is having. So um, I'm not sure if I'm answering that question directly, but yes, you can buy a lot of buses and a lot of train infrastructure, $100 million. We have uh, two questions, um, one of them pretty quick. How can people uh, weigh in on uh, transit and the IA widening? Great question. So um, the EMR, which is, Cal I, should, I should clarify, Cal Transit Affiliate Agency under CEQA. Um, as I mentioned, the, EI, the draft EIR will be coming out in June. Um, I hope it doesn't push slip back any further. Um, so this summer will be the time. Um, Caltrans will be organizing workshops. We're also going to be organizing workshops ourselves um, here locally to make sure we hear from everybody. Um, uh, and you can come to the Yolo Transportation District Board meetings and make your voices heard. Uh, we meet the uh, second Monday of every month. Um, in, in Woodland, uh, and we always love to hear from you. And the Route 42 stops right in front of our office, and it does run later now, so you can get to those evening board meetings. In fact, we we do have a, a new question from our chat um, from Alan Pryor. Uh, UCDs and Duke traffic calculator calculated the addition of the two HOV lanes on I-80 over the post one. Point eight miles of the I-8 freeway will result in an additional 1,276 million miles per year of EMT and save travelers only five to 10 minutes fully built out and fill the traffic. How can that be considered sustainable? Um, and I, I want to add to this another um, kind of comment or question around um, regional transportation being a mess in large part because regional development is a mess. And, um, <laughs> and um, um, you know, with an example of uh, what's happening and what has happened in Woodland with the train depot and you know, around that. Um, so how are we going to revitalize places and, and build out a new uh, positive transportation? So I think those two things are the last two. Okay. And it's a little after class. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I think that the I really like the downtown specific plan here in Davis. I especially like that it includes only a thousand units of housing. Um, I think we have to get over it when it comes to building housing in Davis. Because if we don't build up, we're gonna and, and we're not building out because we have Venture J uh, and the voters have spoken on that. Um, so you know, we can if we don't build up, we're just gonna become increasingly expensive and it just means the students are gonna look further and further away. Um, so I think it's it's uh, it's a reckoning that we need to have uh, uh, if we want people to be able to enjoy this sustainable life. I mean, part of when I was an undergraduate here, I loved that I could live here in Davis and ride my bike everywhere, and it was transformative for me. It was part of what led me down this career path. Um, but the students nowadays that I think of us, they can't do that. Um, not the low-income students. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think we have to get real about building density. The demand is there. Um, and we can build it, um, and uh, and we have to we have to move it forward. Um, and but one final thing I'll say is that we have new laws in California that are requiring us to mitigate vehicle miles travel, which is a very good thing under CEQA. So it's changing the way we do this. And one of the best strategies for mitigating BMT, like from a highway widening, is actually to build more housing near transit. So I'm actually excited that we might be able to actually fund. EOD housing, especially affordable housing, using transportation mitigation dollars. How cool would that be? Um, so building housing, it's not just good for people, it's good for it's good for me and our greenhouse gas turbines as well. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I really want to thank you for joining us today um, and taking this event this on our first private meeting. Um, and um, mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, we know you need to hustle out the door. So we're going to take like a couple minute break um, and then we'll uh, start our um, the next part of our meeting in just a minute or two. We just have a little time to uh, check in as a coalition. Um, and then we're going to spend just a bit of time talking about partnerships and the coalition and kind of the future of that. Um, 
So I'm hoping that um, uh, we'll we'll start. We did start at the beginning of the meeting with um, a little bit of of uh, just sharing where everyone is from. Um, but um, we're wondering uh, if we might be able to pass the mic. Is that possible to do that? Sure, you can. This middle one there, this one there. So we have a, a few um, members here from our um, uh, different uh, parts of full data inclusion. Some of our pretty group leaders and part and representatives of our partners. Um, and so I thought we might start with that. Um, just uh, share, um, you know, one or two things about what's going on with the different parts of the organization that you're involved in, and any um, particular announcements that you have. So I think we're going to start with uh, Lynn Midler. Ah, oh, okay. Um, my guard. Um, so I'm the second item, Yellow Interfaith Alliance for Climate Justice, and we've been around since uh, hmm, almost the whole 10 years, right? Did we form right away? We formed pretty early in Paul Davis's history, and we involved about eight of the faith communities in Davis, and we have a long history of doing um, all sorts of um, actions, actually, um, holding conferences, climate conferences at our various um, facilities and all kinds of um, speakers and events, um, just all sorts of things. And um, we work well together all through those years. And we are actually hosting an event um, right now. Is this, is this the time I should go into this, Chris? Uh, sure. Um, so, oops, there. So, hosting an event right now, which is, oops, sounds like it just went off. Okay. Um, to, um, we're overlapping with Bill McKibben's third act action, which is, I think, about 100 actions across the country that will be happening on the 21st of March. And what he's working on is he, he analyzed things and decided if we could get people to get out of the big three banks withdraw them, go in and say, you know, either you stop um, supporting fossil fuels or we're out. So it's a, you know, there's two steps to it. And um, he's got people all over the country doing all kinds of amazing creative things. So I started one up here in Davis. So our action is also on the 21st for uh, six days. And we'll be meeting first at the, at, at the church, at the um, Presbyterian Church, which is near Central Park. And um, because we have to have a little bit of cover from this pouring rain that day, which is perfect. That's exactly what it's about, climate change. Because <laughs> all this rain is not our normal February. And we'll get together there, and people have been making signs, and I've been making uh, lots of signs. Fun to look at. I'll show you just a couple. Um, you know, all different things and ways for people to know. And just the key thing being, Chase, $382 billion into fossil fuels, and we have a problem. So we'll be gathering our signs. We've got banking songs. I thought of the, the Raging Grand has kind of died during COVID, but the Raging Grand is will be out with us. And we've been practicing our, our banking songs at Congress Market. And we'll be teaching a few of those to whatever group gathers. And we'll be singing and marching with our signs through the streets. It's only a couple blocks, and all three days are lined up. Who could ask for more? And we're going to get our goal was to get a fantastic picture with lots of people and signage um, at each of the banks. And then we have people cutting up their credit cards, ready, ready to do that at Chase, three or four of them already. So hopefully we'll just, you know, we'll get the good images, which is what we need for the PR, and then um, have fun, a lot of fun too, because we've been working together on it. And it's good doing actions. It feels better than just sitting saying, how can we make it better? So, and join us. It's Lynn, why don't you pass the mic to Corey? Right. Uh, I'm Torin, the new executive director of Tree Davis. Uh, um, and um, 
This is my first uh, coalition meeting, so I'm excited and hopefully I'm sharing relevant information. I think many of you are aware that the city uh, is just about to complete the urban forest management plan. Uh, it's up for council vote on the 21st, another good climate action. Um, there's been a lot of comments that have been received by the city and reacted, um, I think, with great uh, effort to you know be listening to the community and making the management plan as strong as possible. So that's fantastic. Um, we've got some great um, opportunities coming up for um, for people to get involved, uh, the Davis Manor neighborhood, um, the park, the end street park that they have pushed for for many years um, is coming to complete and we're doing a native plants and tree installation um, this Saturday and Sunday, regardless of whether it rains, we're gonna do it. Um, so we're very excited about that. And we're also planning an Arbor Day uh, celebration um, for National Arbor Day on April 29th here in Central Park. And also probably having a really great bike ride to seeing remarkable trees and well-shaded parking lots and, and aspirational concepts for the future. We're all excited about that. We'd love to meet all of you. So thank you so much. Chris, you sure that's good. Uh, um, how about uh, Rick? Bike campaign. Many of you already know me, so I won't get into long explanations. We've been around for about 12 years. Uh, Davis is my hometown, and I found it fascinating that thousands and thousands of people move here every year, and a lot of those people don't know how to ride a bike. I mean, it, it's not in the DNA, and it was not on the SAT test either. So um, that caused us to uh, look more deeply into encouraging people to ride bikes, and um, I couldn't stir up the interest I was interested in in Davis, and so we started in Woodland, where even fewer people ride bikes. And somebody said, well, good luck with that, because the only people in Woodland riding bikes uh, have DUIs or, uh, <laughs> or are homeless. Or for next they said, they were looking at me. I thought, well, that's interesting. You know, maybe we can change things. And it is exciting to see that Woodland has changed things, and there's a lot of very proactive, very pro-bike people in that community. Uh, we now uh, do bike skills training classes as part of PE curriculum at their elementary school. And we started that in Davis because people aren't born knowing how to ride bikes and they're not born knowing how to use them as transportation. And we feel that anytime that we can encourage somebody to use a bike, it's a skill that they can keep for a lifetime that makes a big difference in how long that lifetime might be. So we operate two bike garage locations. Um, we've been working together with Anthony over the past few years about getting people who begin to lose their mobility up on our tri shot. It's a very joyful thing, and it gets more people again involved with bikes here in our community, and, and it's very exciting to see that. We also work on um, four different community bike lanes where we try to get as many people as possible up on bikes because we have a beautiful asset in Davis, which is our Davis bike loop. And so if we can get hundreds and hundreds of people. And at our zombie bike ride, we get thousands of people now, and we're looking into turning this into a weekend long, really uh, significant community event that draws people from all over. And I would hope most of them coming on Amtrak with their bikes. So um, community bike rides are far away that we promote what's happening in the community, and we hope that Woodland will be the next place that develops a bike loop so that we can do the same thing there. Okay, Anthony, you want to uh, speak about Bike Davis? Uh, I'm Anthony Paul here, so I'm one of my many hats as I'm a board member of Bike Davis, which is a bicycle advocacy uh, nonprofit here in, in town. And what we do primarily, we, we work a lot with Marie's group and the bike club and, and trying to make biking fun, but we're more on the uh, infrastructure side and, and uh, helping get people um, over barriers, physical barriers, uh, or barriers that keep people from being able to bike, uh, you know, biking to school, um, biking around town for practical purposes. So we are work, we work very closely with the city bike co coordinator and public works department to try to identify issues that, that people bring to us and that we see a community and just try to try to keep those projects moving forward uh, and try to do this. Make life stripes and buffer lanes. The fact that they make riding the bike is so much more important. And, that, and that's something, yeah, the, the street standards that the, the city adopted a few years ago, they, they didn't always 
they didn't always strike the streets consistent with the state, their own standards, and that was something else we did quite a bit of this and putting those out in a territory for the embellishment. So why don't you hand it off to Scott and uh, Scott, I think, covered uh, YCC and the uh, one strike kits. Okay. We're here so that we don't have to spray. So, and um, Chris, I guess uh, one of the things that's new uh, for me is I know I've kind of show a member, so I'll have to talk about that fee. Anyway, um, so I'm holding this time because that's what we do at the Yolo Climate Emergency Coalition. Um, the Yolo Climate, Emer uh, Yolo, sorry, Yolo Climate Emergency Coalition was started uh, with the Youth Climate Strike in 2019. And you might recall that there were about 1,500 kids in that park where we were there arguing about why it was that, that uh, the adults in the room weren't actually paying attention. So a group of us adults got together at the Yolo County Library here in Davis, and this is a Yolo Climate Emergency Coalition, so it's not just Davis people. And we, we started thinking about how we can make some changes. And the, there's a couple of things we advocate for, one, for, one of which was marginalized community and centering around marginalized community, which is most affected by climate change. And so we paid attention to that at the county level. There are two major things that happened as a result. Uh, there were many things that happened, but one of the major things that happened is the establishment of the Yolo Climate, Yolo County Climate Action Commission, which is a, an 11 member body that meets every Monday from 4 to 6 30, it's a two and a half hour meeting. Uh, it is the, I believe, the fourth Monday of the month. I do recommend that people who are interested in what we can do at a, at a regional level attend that meeting and hear what they have to say. There is a body here that isn't involved either in transportation or in, uh, in plant uh, diversity or anything else that matters in terms of our environment. So I highly recommend it. And it's one of the things that I think has had probably the biggest impact. That body had a million dollars directed to it in, in uh, ARP money right off the bat. Okay, so the other thing that I think uh, the Yolo Climate Emergency Coalition and the people around it, the youth as well as the adults did, is move the needle when it comes to the, the Inflation Reduction Act. That uh, $369 billion that was the first time the federal government ever put money in real money into climate change happened because of the movement from those children who moved that needle for us to get the politicians to realize they wouldn't be elected if they didn't do something about climate change. So I just want to point out that the activism that is in the community needs to be uh, brought along. It needs to be part of the infrastructure. It's not just people rabble-rousing. These are people with real ideas that are changing the environment for you. So I kind of look at it this way. Where are the people who have, have lived experience? Where are the people who are talking about Cool Davis or here in Yolo County? We need to think about this much more strategically and frankly need to do a lot more to lean in, create adulted, responsible, resilient community. So I'm holding the sign because this is, a, this is one of the actions that the youth have identified. The other group I work with is Rise for Our Future. This is the Greta Thunberg group that started the climate strike back in 2019 and does this every year. We have a somewhat muted response here in the states because of the, both the school district policies that keep kids on campus and will not let them express themselves as they would choose to. And they, uh, I want to point that out because if this is a this was an action, this hard cutting action for Chase Bank, Wells Fargo, Bank of America that we need to support. If you have any of those cards underwritten, I don't know what you're doing, frankly. I do not know. So you better talk to your, your spouse. You better talk to people around you in your lives who have these cards. My wife is going to hate cutting her card. 
you know, we've had uh, we've had a, uh, a, a a frequent flyer card forever, and frankly, I don't fly anymore. So I just want to say that there are things that we need to do. We need to do a little bit more drastic action. Um, that's what Yellow Climate University was all about. We were not polite. We were loud. We've been to the city uh, city council meetings. We've gone to the board uh, at the county level. We are present and we are asking hard questions. So thanks. And I'll give this to Alan. Yeah. Yeah. I think Alan is a mass um, and then we'll, we'll um, talk for a few minutes about uh, the strategic planning that Will Davis is doing and um, our next step in our partners. Hi, I'm Bill Davis and Russell. Bill you know, Davis and Russell and I have been working on, he came up and invited me. We've been working on transit together for 30 years, but I think it's actually 35. <laughs> So uh, I'm just told that I remember that there was a there was controversy played by bicycles on the rails of the Caltrain system in the Bay Area. Um, right now, your mobility is looking at a green transit. We have a really group that follows it, but follows it quite closely. And we have we're developing a briefing paper that gives you the background on the AAD, which puts it in larger context. It's, it's actually connected to about 30 or 40 other of freeway congestion relief projects that are bottle of fixing all along I-80 from Martinez Bridge all the way to Watt Avenue. So we had to get past along the freeway so we can possibly get the day but a lot of that here's the question that should we be doing this thing, um, which we make the driving more convenient. We're also going to have a monthly uh, Zoom call meeting, which varies, that we can talk to so you can very convenient. And we also have a group, group that keeps you up to date on what's happening with the Olo Transportation District. And uh, again, we're wondering whether if the point is to make driving less convenient and get people to transit while we're making driving more convenient. So uh, thank you. I hope you can join us. And we're in, this is the big this is about this white line about 20% of the cap greenhouse reduction plan for the city of Davis. Thanks, Tom. Are we gonna have any time to quick update and see? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so Carrie Lux, I know most of you with City of Davis, and um, we are a partner, um, but we're a different kind of partner than many of the other partners. Um, and I am a former Cool Davis board member and currently the assigned staff liaison to Cool Davis from the City of Davis. So I'm um, really interested in all the programs that we do. And I don't want to take too much time, but I do just want to mention a few things. Um, uh, cool Davis staff report to city council is happening on consent next Tuesday, and that's basically an update to city council on what the funding that the city has provided to Cool Davis has been used for over the last four years, and including this coming year, $200,000 already provided, another 50000 in this budget year. So the um, material was provided by Cool Davis, and um, uh, just giving council an update of all the great stuff that Cool Davis does. Um, and um, we are currently today is the deadline for environmental recognition awards, which is a program that is in the, I think the 27 year um, from the Natural Resources Commission, the commission that John sits on and that I staff. Um, if you are interested in submitting a nomination, today is the deadline, but if you let me know, um, we can have a little bit of wiggle room this week, um, but we have gotten some really nice nominations already. So just wanted to let you know about that. And those will be presented on April 18th, which is the closest city council day to Earth Day. Um, the other thing that's happening on April 18th is that is our targeted date for bringing the final climate action and adaptation plan to city council. So that is um, a lot um, longer time to develop that project. Um, I'm the project manager um, that we originally anticipated, but that is based on a lot of community input and we have to be very responsive to the community. So it's a plan that we're really excited about. It's a planning document, not an implementation document, but it has a lot of these issues in there, a lot of making car driving less attractive by doing some actions down the line, not immediately, but like congestion pricing, parking pricing, um, um, other types of actions, in addition to providing for electric vehicles and charging in the community. 
Um, I'll wrap up, but um, we are doing some building electrification projects and outreach. Um, just submitted some grant applications to help with that outreach and doing some other work around that, as well as EV charging. We're currently implementing some charging stations in the downtown area based on a SACOG grant that we got. We're only doing the implementation of the grant requirements, but following that, we'll do the next phase, which will involve a lot more community engagement. So we'll have more money left over from the grant than what is required by guidelines. And so that's um, something to do. And then the last thing I want to say, and sorry for taking so much time, but um, one of the parts of my job as sustainability coordinator for the city of Davis is to really focus on regional collaboration. And um, Otto didn't get a chance to mention it, but Yellow County Transportation District is one of the agencies, along with all four cities, the university, um, the air district and other agencies that participated in a grant that Yolo County submitted to Caltrans for a regionally coordinated zero emissions vehicle master plan. And I'm just really, really excited about it because I think that you know the message was given that we need more regional coordination on this. And I'm so grateful to Yolo County for pulling all this together. And hopefully we'll get funded. They've been working pretty closely with Caltrans to make sure that the grant application is well funded and we'll end up with a task force of all of those agencies and our partners to talk about it and also come up with some ways to really make um, transportation closer to more zero emission. So that's all I wanted to say. Thanks for the time. Sorry for no, taking no, too much time. <laughs> Glad you were uh, you uh, so um, thank you all. Um, we wanted to switch from um, this to uh, talking um, a little bit about um, you know what's happening with Davis right now. Um, and I think I still have a few board members who might be joining this uh, discussion uh, with our partners and working with leaders. Um, so over the last uh, about year and a half, the person has been um, engaging in a strategic planning process. Um, and part of that process, we invited all of our working group leaders and members of the coalition and um, uh, partners to give us feedback um, in a survey. Um, it's featured on in QR codes today because we, we got about 23 responses um, from uh, folks and um, uh, we got a lot of good feedback um, and a lot of kind of um, view of sort of the capacity levels at that time, but of course, you know, last spring and last summer um, is different than now. And so we're trying to kind of renew that conversation um, as the um, uh, board completes its kind of plan for Cool Davis. We really want to uh, be engaging even more deeply with our coalition partners um, as we um, start to look at our role in the Davis community and in the region. Um, so, um, some of the things, um, I'm having trouble with getting the um, thing, um, the presentation to work correctly. So, let me um, see if I can get it up right now. Um, so we can, um, um so uh, Lisa was here earlier, but she had to leave. Um, but Lisa has been leading, um, 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 working with us on um, developing the strategic plan, and we're now looking at a draft document. Um, like I said, um, and Ken Hirsch is here today. He is part of that uh, task force and our board president, um, uh, Jason Bone. Um, the partner uh, coalition survey, like I said, had 23 responses. Um, it was a really good cross-section of our partners and individuals who participated in the coalition and support working groups. Um, it had a lot of really good information on the partner capacities and interests, which were very varied. Um, obviously, a lot of um, discussion coming from different perspectives, um, whether food or transportation or energy, especially. Um, and uh, one of the things we did ask in that survey was some give input on um, full data and its goals and planning. Um, so um, here's a few things that we heard. Um, the there was four big questions 
and um, where we kind of looked at the um, ideal vision, um, asked about what people's ideal vision of the region and the, and the community was and um, in response to climate change. Um, and then we also asked about um, the unique role that Cool Davis and the Cool Davis Coalition might play or did, does play in that. Um, and then um, we asked for feedback on uh, things that people thought we should be doing. Um, so we got a lot of sort of new ideas or focus on, again, um, specific areas like in transportation and um, uh, electric vehicles and also uh, specifics around seeking funding um, and working collaboratively to seek funding. Um, and um, some call outs specifically related to um, the implementation of the downtown plan. Um, and then finally, we asked about how can we do better and what can we do different? And um, so, uh, two big categories um, of content were about being more public, being more active, doing better marketing, and having a higher profile for climate and the work that we are all doing collectively. Um, and um, and then some very sort of focused on, re on how we're doing outreach and engaging more um, landlords, um, engaging multifamily households and rental houses. So those are some highlights. Um, but like I said, um, you know that was last spring and early summer when we did that, and um, we're seeking out some, some more input. Um, we're hoping, um, and we're getting out in the next several months to more. Um, potential partners in the community and asking for their input as well. So um, I just, um, that's uh, what I want to share with you. And I thought that I would open this up to questions or um, ideas and um, how you is a partner um, organization or as a um, working leader would like uh, Cool Davis and the board to proceed with engaging you on, um, in this work. So uh, one thing that Chris and I have been working on uh, recently in, in an effort to strengthen the coalition and, and to uh, uh, clarify what it means to be a, a partner of Cool Davis, um, we, we have uh, created a document, of, an FAQ for uh, uh, Cool Davis partners. And, and uh, because there's a, a wide uh, variety of organizations that we're trying to attract. And so uh, there, are, there are smaller nonprofits and then there are bigger commercial enterprises. And we want all of those uh, organizations to have a place in, in, in the coalition. And so that, that's what we've been working on. And, and I think we're, we'll publish that uh, um, sometime in the future, just so everybody knows. But but really, the, 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 the like for my business, um, our goal or our mission as a green building company uh, aligns pretty directly with the mission of Cool Davis. But there are other businesses in town that, that um, may only align in terms of uh, just wanting to have a stronger community and, and a viable community. And so we want to have an avenue for, for all of those workers to, to be part of our, our effort to uh, uh, make our, our community a better place. Uh, Everybody, um, I don't have anything really planned, but I'm inspired here to kind of jump up and, and add, <laughs> add, some, add some thoughts here. Everybody, hear me okay? But, um, you know, like Chris said, um, you know, we're working hard, but it's, it's taking some time, and part of that is just the last year and a half and COVID, and the organization has gone through a lot of changes. The board has grown a lot, so we've got new people, new voices, new ideas. Um, a really important um, point right now, and we're really looking at all different aspects. You know, I'm, I'm really excited to see all these people that I haven't really met before, um, and our connections to the coalition, our connections to all these nonprofits and other groups that do their own piece and are passionate about that. If we can connect more strongly with each other and work together, I think we can make a bigger impact. On our communities and help each other either fundraising or meetings like this. We're cool to we provide a little piece of the pie, someone else can buy a little piece of the pie. I think we're really looking at trying to build a stronger network of organizations. And, and because Cool Davis can't 
you can do all this work. The city can't do all this work. It, you know, it, it takes a, a lot of people working together in the same direction. Um, you know, ideas from each of those pieces. I think it's going to make us a, a, a cool data system organization. I think it's going to help make our communities more resilient. So I hope that gives you a perspective of you know what Cool Davis is trying to think, think bigger and connect more deeply. And um, so I'm excited for where where we are. We still have a lot of work to do. Um, the big data giving is going to be a really important um, thing for us. But we're going to I think slowly between now and then bring out more of the strategic plan that we feel comfortable sharing, and we're going to be um, you know talking about that. And so we're looking to, you know, and reach out with you guys as we get closer to that and work together to, you know, maybe bring in some additional funds to do more of this hybrid stuff. You know, DNA, really appreciate what you've done for us today. Um, this is a, a model we want to, you know, reproduce and hopefully help other groups that don't have the resources. Um, so, like I said, I'm inspired, <laughs> inspired to talk. Didn't have anything really to say, but I thought I would add, add that and, and let you know kind of where the board, board is going and where we are in the strategic plans. With that, thank you. Would anyone else like to share some thoughts or ask a question? There's snack. Did anybody have any questions? Okay, I, I think um, I just want to say thank you to you all for coming and um, having patience through all of this hybrid. Thanks to everybody that's still online. Um, if you want to unmute and um, uh, um, say hi and wave, um, Robin and Joel and Kevin, we would, you know, we'll be able to see you if you do that. I don't know if you're still on there, but. Um, Maybe not. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I thank you again for your uh, your joining us, and we have some you know food to share, and um, there's water and um, some hot water for tea. If anybody wants to stay and chat for a little while, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you.